we did have an opportunity to test that, you know, that uh, approach when we, we found this first signal. Hi, I'm Lukas and this is Space Talks, the place where you can get inspired by the space sector. In this episode, I'm talking with Simon Pete Warden, a retired general of the US Air Force, former head of NASA Ames, and currently the executive director of a fantastic breakthrough initiatives. So if you would like to know how we seek for life in other galaxies, are there any procedures in case of receiving a confirmed signal from other civilizations, or just listen to the fantastic story of Pete himself, including helping smaller countries like Rwanda or the Kingdom of Bhutan to join the space sector, this is the episode. So enjoy the talk and don't forget to subscribe to us for more. Pete, I would like to start our talk with a question regarding your recent function. Um, if you are the executive director of the Breakthrough Initiatives, can you tell me more about this exciting entity? What are its goals and origins? And are you looking for any partnerships or, or people who can join you on this unique path? Well, that, that, those are very good questions. Uh, you know, let me uh, start by going back about uh, almost 10 years. Uh, I was the director director of NASA's Ames Research Center in Silicon Valley. And uh, I was approached by uh, Vanity Fair, who's <laughs> actually the, the uh, you know, the, uh, and they, they weren't there looking at, at doing a fashion show. <laughs> they were interested in, uh, uh, they, uh, they put on the post Oscar party in Hollywood. It's supposedly the best party in Hollywood, although I've never been there. And, uh, but it turned out uh, the, uh, a number of high net worth people go to that, including, you know, Mark Zuckerberg and, and Yuri Milner and others. And they decided they wanted to start a, 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 a way to encourage young people to go into sciences. And, uh, and so the idea was to give the world's largest prizes, uh, uh, 3 million US dollars. Uh, there's uh, six or seven of them each year, plus some early career and, a, and actually a prize for, for, you know, young people between the ages of 13 and 18. And they were looking for a location to uh, to do this uh, uh, the ceremony, and they picked NASA Ames. And so I got to know these folks pretty well. And in 2014, uh, Yuri Milner, who was the founding member, is a, is a Russian-Israeli uh, high net worth person. Uh, that he's a physicist by background, and he was very interested in the question of life in the universe. So he talked to me quite extensively in 2014 and 2015. And he said he wanted to actually fund significant funding, private funding for efforts to look for life in the universe. And so he started the Breakthrough Initiatives. Uh, and I was hired as the chairman of the, of the foundation, Breakthrough Prize Foundation, but most of my work is the executive director of the Breakthrough Initiatives. And we currently have uh, uh, four major initiatives. And we're, we're looking at adding a couple more. But the first one is devoted to a uh, search for intelligent signals, the, what's called SETI, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. And uh, uh, Mr. Milner committed 100 million US dollars in a 10 year program. We're about two thirds of the way through that. Uh, we, uh, we didn't find anything until uh, late last year. We actually found the first time a signal that, uh, that actually looked like it could be a you know, what we call a techno signature. And it was, interestingly enough, is from the nearest star system, Proxima Centauri. Uh, we're now virtually certain that it's interference caused by some, you know, terrestrial or, you know, satellite in orbit, uh, but not quite 100%. So that's uh, that's called break Breakthrough Listen Candidate One. Uh, we've, we've, we're working with most observatories around the world at optical and radio. Uh, so the, the question about partnerships, uh, many of those efforts are partnerships with the scientific institutes. The, the second effort uh, uh, was a breakthrough uh, Starshot, which we started in 2016. And that's a effort to figure out if we can actually go visit nearby star systems sometime later this century. It's my favorite, I might add. <clears throat> but we're, uh, uh, the, the only way we could figure out how to do that was to take a laser driven light sail. So you have a a laser that's really huge, like a hundred gigawatts of power or more. It's, that's a kilometer or several kilometers in scale. 
And uh, we would then put a, a, a really small satellite, you know, gram class satellite on a, on a light sail, which is a very tenuous material, like mylar is a light sail material. And we'd hit it with this laser for about, you know, maybe up to an hour. Uh, that would accelerate it to 20% the speed of light. And uh, then it coast for decades and it would fly by the nearest star and, and hopefully be able to relay information back. We'll probably send a lot of them because some of them are going to, we're going to lose a lot of them in interstellar space. They'll hit dust and so on. So that program is 100 million to begin the research and it's going very well. We've finished the first phase of the laser device and uh, uh, probably in the next year or two, we'll start phase two, which is actually doing some hardware, you know, full scale development. The third project is Breakthrough Watch, which is that uh, the primary project there was to see if we could find a, uh, uh, a life-bearing exoplanet. And uh, we did find uh, orbiting Alpha Centauri A, the, uh, the nearest star system, which is the biggest star, it's a little bigger than our sun, a, uh, what looks like a giant planet, something like Neptune or Saturn, orbiting in the habitable zone of Alpha Centauri A. Now, the interesting thing about that is that was uh, if you remember the, the movie Avatar uh, 10 years ago, uh, there's a giant planet orbiting Alpha Centauri A uh, in the habitable zone, and it has moons, one of which is not only habitable, but it's inhabited by aliens. And uh, uh, it's interesting that we we got in touch with James Cameron, the director and producer of Avatar, and he, uh, our fourth major project is we have a annual uh, conference called Breakthrough Discuss. Uh, I think this it'll it'll be it's usually scheduled around the 12th of April, which is the anniversary of Yuri Gagarin's flight, and uh, in fact Yuri Milner was named after him. And uh, uh, so we uh, uh, this we've had it online the last year because of COVID, but we're hoping next year to do it in person. Probably end up doing the uh, the in person part in Europe, uh, and probably in Luxembourg, right? We have an office we've opened there. Uh, we are looking at other things. We've uh, done studies about potentially putting, you know, uh, privately funded probes to go look for life in the, the atmosphere of Venus, for example. And uh, in fact, one of the discussions that we've begun is working with the Polish Space Agency on, on a Venus mission. So that's very exciting. And we are looking for partners in these. Uh, we have a couple other satellite programs we're looking at uh, that uh, I can't say too much about yet because they're not formally announced, but uh, uh, very exciting stuff. And we're you know, hopefully we'll answer this fundamental question, are we alone? Uh, so you, you mentioned one of these uh, projects I'm interested, the Breakthrough Starship project. Um, and you mentioned that you focus on, on, on going to Alpha Centauri and probably one of the nearby planets, Proxima Alpha Centauri B. So my, my, my question is, why not all these efforts to the solar system? Why, why not another effort to speed up the colonization of our system first? Well, that's an excellent question. Uh, I'm uh, I'm actually very, you know, big supporter of of settling, you know, our solar system and and eventually expanding interstellar. Uh, of course, as a as a kind of a scientist, my uh, most of my effort is kind of on the on the on the very speculative, the far end of things. So, you know, I, I'm very excited about you know if if we're ever going to go to the nearest star systems, we need to know what's there, and. Uh, uh, but at the same time, we are, you know, as I said, the foundation is looking for evidence of life in our own solar system. Uh, for example, if we find life on Mars, that will change a lot of our discussion of, about settling there. I mean, it it, uh, it may make it more difficult because you're worried about, you know, is that life compatible with ours? Uh, uh, are we going to damage it or is it going to damage us? Uh, and of course, I'm of the opinion there probably is life uh, under the surface on Mars, so that's an interesting question. Uh, the moon, of course, uh, doesn't seem to have any evidence of any life process as far as we know. Uh, so I'm I'm quite a strong supporter of, of, of putting uh, settlements uh, this decade uh, on the moon, and there are a number of private groups that are very interested in that. Uh, uh, so I think ultimately we're going to see by the end of this decade private settlements on the moon. And, uh, and then depending on what we find on Mars, probably early in the next decade, uh, you know, people like Elon Musk will be sending settlements to Mars. So I'm very excited about that. Um, you, you, you mentioned also about these uh, interviews, about this signal from, from, from Proxima Centauri. And as, as you said, it, it was confirmed that it's like rather interference. 
But my question is totally not about this situation. It's a, it's a broader uh, topic. You probably heard something about the theory called the dark forest. So maybe we shouldn't be so eager to, to, to go outside our solar system and, and seek for other civilizations, as perhaps we are safer not to find them yet. Well, I, you know, and I'm very familiar with that uh, idea. In fact, uh, when we started our initiatives, uh, Stephen Hawking, Professor Hawking, was our senior science advisor, and he was very cautious about. It. We initially had a, a, a initiative that we were going to uh, think about messaging. You know, we called it breakthrough message. We decided after talking to a number of experts, largely due to concern about, uh, you know, the dark forest, uh, you know, that 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 we would not do anything about messages. Uh, however, I think any uh, civilization, if it's nearby, uh, it almost assuredly knows that we're here anyhow, because we've we haven't been very quiet in terms of, you know, uh, in fact, that's what we're looking for. What's called leakage from a civilization, and uh, so I'm, uh, you know, I'm less worried about it than perhaps Professor Hawking was, and uh, uh, on the other hand, I think it's it's it it is a legitimate concern. But we it, we don't know what we don't know. And, uh, uh, you know, you, you wouldn't want to make a mistake on something that important, you know, that the, uh, so I, I think that I tend to be cautious about any effort to send particular messages. Uh, you know, on the other hand, I think that before we even send a probe to the Alpha Centauri system, we'll get a lot more data from remote sensing, which we're doing now, find out what planets are there, you know, carefully watch if we see any evidence of any signal. Uh, you know, the, the interesting thing about Proxima Centauri is it does have a planet that's Earth size that's in the habitable zone, although it's a very, you know, it's a red dwarf star, so it's a small, it's a it's much different environment than probably the Earth has with the sun. Uh, so it's, uh, you know, I think our view is the best thing to do now is to observe and not speak. You know, it's, uh, uh, my, my father used to tell me it's, uh, it, it's always better to sit quietly in the corner and watch rather than open your mouth. So, uh, Pete, my, my question actually is uh, uh, continuing uh, the previous one, but because having you here, the retired Brigadier General involved in the past in strategic space programs of, of US force, DARPA, NASA Ames, I must ask the question that intrigues me a lot. What if? What are the procedures in, in, in case we will receive a confirmed signal from another civilization? Uh, will this knowledge be hidden from us, or the military go first, or maybe there's already such a preemptive project in motion to lightly prepare us for such a situation? There is a lot of talk about cooperation with the movie industries, etc. So th th this is very the, the question that is always in my mind for the last ten of years. Well, it, actually, it turns out that as far as I know, there's no. Uh, protocol or procedures, at least in the United States, and I don't think there are other places, uh, the, the approach that we were taking, and we have taken, is that that before you get all excited about a signal, it needs to be published and peer-reviewed. So we have, in fact, uh, our papers are written on the what we call the Break the Listen Candidate One, have just been accepted in Nature Astronomy, and so those will be coming out in a few weeks. Uh, uh, so our intent is if we did you know, conclude that this signal could have actually come from Proxima uh, uh, B, uh, we would have published what we found in open literature. And uh, of course, we were happy to, you know, do interviews about what we found. Uh, I think it's very likely that, uh, that 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 would be the initial effort. Uh, now, you know, it's, uh, you know, clearly various governments would probably, you know, have their own internal analysis. But uh, we, we think that once we've uh, validated a, a signal and that, you know, we published, then it's not our job to really worry about that. that then that's when governments take over. And uh, uh, we certainly wouldn't do anything beyond, you know, just trying to observe it. And, uh, uh, you know, when, and we, as, as I said, we did have an opportunity to test that, you know, that uh, uh, approach when we, we found this first signal. And we're, we're pretty happy that the, scientific community uh, received it very well and uh, you know we didn't claim uh, uh, you know anything that uh, uh, was uh, you know 
too speculative. So it was, uh, you know, I think everybody was pretty happy with it. So you mentioned that there are no procedures, right, for for this kind of you know situation that something will be hidden from us, but everything will be exposed to everyone. The, the only, yeah, the, uh, there aren't, as far as I know, the only procedures that have been published are the the International Academy of Astronautics has a working group called the SETI Working Group, which I'm a member of, and uh, they have published various uh, recommended procedures you know how to handle you know seeing a, a signal and how one gets announced uh, you know there's a it's not a very long list it's you know but it, it basically says to do what we've done we did which was you know publish it scientifically so people can themselves observe and validate that what we saw Okay, so uh, my question is regarding uh, our expense here in the solar system. What are your predictions regarding the humans, uh, uh, humanity's expense in the solar system? Where we do go next? Because we are talking a lot about Mars. Uh, what next? The Titan? The belt? In some place? Well, I, those are good questions. I think from my opinion, I'm very excited about uh, the asteroid belt, particularly the asteroid series, which is does seem to have some uh, water uh it's got a low gravity but uh, uh i'm sort of intrigued with that uh, television series called the expanse that was that uh but there's a couple interesting things that uh, that i think will enable humanity to begin to expand probably into the uh, into the asteroid belt and the the uh, outer solar system uh, one of those is a, is a much more efficient propulsion scheme uh i'm very excited about uh, uh fusion propulsion. There are a couple companies making good progress on this, and I think maybe in a decade or, or so, we'll begin to see much more efficient propulsion. That's what really will enable us to, to get, you know, beyond the moon and Mars. And uh, uh, so I could see later this century that, you know, that you begin to see human expansion in, in the asteroid belt, uh, uh, you know, maybe the moons of the outer planets. Uh, Titan is interesting. Uh, but I'm not sure how hospitable it is. You know, it's it's cold, and uh, uh, the uh, there may be life there as well. Uh, but I think that I, I think we, we'd see humans on the large asteroids first is the next thing. Uh, interestingly enough, I mean, you know, the, in the long run, uh, uh, the, the upper atmosphere of Venus is kind of interesting. Uh, it's uh, The temperature and pressure is about what it is uh, in, in our room, uh, except that the, the, the sulfuric acid droplets that are very pure. Uh, but uh, you know, there's ideas that maybe you could do floating habitats there, uh, and I, there may be life there too. That's another. That's why we're looking. Uh, so Venus gets to be kind of interesting. But I'd say the primary targets is, are going to be uh, the Moon, Mars, and then some of the large asteroids. Mm. So just like an expense, actually. Um, uh, yeah. So my, my question next is: You mentioned at the beginning that that that, that the this breakthrough initiatives were funded by let's ha let's say very rich people, and uh, you probably saw all the comments recently after this Branson and, and Bezos flight, and there is a lot of comments why rich people spend a lot of money for space. In this case, in your case, it's even like outer space and not fixing our planet. So why, why it's needed from this? Point? That's a very good question, but I think that uh, you know the uh, you know the issue is there are many ways to make our civilization better. One of those, and I think uh, certainly for my sponsor, uh, it's uh, that uh, knowledge, and you know it. That in the long run, it's the it's the scientific knowledge that will make human life better, and it's a uh, you know it sort of uh, addresses the human spirit. And I think that that uh, I don't you know there's a lot of people spending money, a lot of high net worth people like Bill Gates on uh, on uh, on addressing you know disease and other things, and governments spend. I mean on COVID, I mean how many trillions of euros or dollars were spent on uh, addressing that. So I'm not sure that a high net worth person can do a lot more uh, in, in that. Uh, you know, obviously there's, there's climate challenges. Uh, there are 
high net worth people that are funding efforts to, to try to figure out solutions to that. Uh, uh, including, uh, you know, my sponsor, he puts money into things like how does the brain work? Uh, how do you address certain diseases and, uh, and also very interested in climate change and other things. So it's, you know, I think it's, it's not an either or. Uh, the, uh, you know, certainly, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, Bezos, Branson and, and uh, Musk, all, all three who I know, uh, uh, you know, they do a lot of things and they fund other things. But, <clears throat> you know, I think that their role for our future is that that a if humanity is spread throughout the solar system and eventually beyond, that's our ultimate survival. So I, I think that they've chosen that particular thing to to do. I mean, I tend to applaud it. I would if if, if I was ever that wealthy, that's what I would have done. And uh, uh, it's sort of interesting in the United States, for example, uh, really since the 19th century, most large telescopes, astronomy, is funded by by uh, private efforts. Not all of it, but. Uh, uh, so I think this is to be encouraged and applauded, and uh, you know I I really think it's it's kind of a, a uh, you're not asking the right question when you're asking well why don't you fund something else? This is what they're interested in. This is what they can they feel they can contribute to the to humanity's future, uh, and they're all very interested in in you know when you when you've made all this money you want to figure out okay what what am I going to leave behind? How am I going to make uh, the planet better and uh, uh, some of them want to make, uh, you know, humanity a multi-planet species, and I'm with them. <laughs> that's that's absolutely understandable. So um, um, let me come back to you, actually, how, how your journey into the space sector um, uh, started. What, what what had driven you to, to do so? Well, quite a long time ago. I was I was born in 1949, so I'm an old guy. Uh, the uh, uh, but. In the uh, in the mid 1950s, of course, there was growing interest in space, and uh, uh, my the first books my mother got me were two little books called one was called Stars and one was called Planets, and I actually felt the Stars one was more interesting because the you know the planets I mean there was no kind of interesting aliens or anything so uh, right away when I was about five six years old I decided I wanted to be an astronomer and study the stars and uh, I consistently stayed in that. Mode and then of course during the 1960s was the Apollo program and uh, uh, you know I wanted an astronaut so I uh, I went to the University of Michigan and majored in astronomy and physics uh, and joined the Air Force uh, you know officer training program there and uh, uh, you know the uh, I actually the first paying job I had other than you know cleaning things up in a restaurant was uh, <clears throat> was at the uh, uh, a solar observatory the University of Michigan had that. It was during the Apollo program. We, uh, you know, there had to be a flare patrol observer around the world every five minutes. Look at the sun to see if you could see a, a flare. If there was a large flare and the astronauts were up, uh, it could be very dangerous. It killed them. <clears throat> and so, the uh, so we were so I was part of the Apollo program as a as a as a student. Uh, but uh, <clears throat> you know, then joined the Air Force. I spent uh, uh, I was in the basic research area, but. Uh, uh, then I got involved very much in the 1980s in, in some major strategic initiatives like the Missile Defense Initiative, the Star Wars program. Uh, I worked twice at the White House and uh, got involved in, you know, kind of planning where's our next our move both in civil and military space. Uh, and, uh, you know, I left the, uh, the Air Force in 2003, retired, uh, uh, but uh, spent a couple years as a college professor in astronomy. and. Uh, then uh, I was I was in the running to be the uh, head of NASA then, and they end up picking my best friend, Mike Griffin, who uh, asked me to come and, and work for NASA, although he said not in Washington because he thought I was too outspoken. And uh, so I uh, he, he uh, offered me the directorship of NASA Ames. And so I was there for uh, almost 10 years. Uh, and then uh, Yuri Milner, uh, you know, talked me into, didn't take much talking is to, because I, I, you know, I decided as a, you know, now that I'm sort of retirement age, what I really want to do is, is look for life in the universe. That's the question that I think is fundamental. So, uh, you know, I'm still, uh, you know, pretty close to the, the, the people in the government, both NASA and, and now the U.S. Space Force. So, uh, I also do a lot of international work. I'm on the, the board of trustees of the International Space University in Strasbourg. Uh, we've opened an office in Luxembourg and I spend about two thirds of my time in Europe. So, uh, you know, it's very exciting stuff. Uh, 
you know, one of the things that we're starting to look at is is how we can. Uh, a lot of uh, smaller countries uh, are getting very interested in space. I mean, Luxembourg is a good example. Uh, I helped them uh, start their space program, and they've they've got over 60 startups now, quite successful. Uh, I've just been asked to help Rwanda and Africa, and and I'm working a little bit with the Kingdom of Bhutan, in the, in, the, in the Himalayas. So that's it. Exciting stuff. It keeps me busy. Uh, like you are working with them for them to join into the space sector. Am I? Is, is yes, that correct. A, absolutely. Wow. Uh, <clears throat> The uh, uh, Rwanda is very interested in, you know, they've launched CubeSat and they're interested in, in using space both for economic development, uh, environmental monitoring and for uh, inspiring their people. Bhutan is the same the same way they launched their first CubeSat a couple years ago. Uh, I actually went to Bhutan and, you know, I got to meet His Majesty the King of Bhutan and he became a very good friend. He actually came to the U.S. for my 70th birthday, so it was quite an honor to have the the king and queen of Bhutan there, the, you know, but uh, but again, his objective is to have use space to inspire his people. And, uh, you know, young people are very excited about space. And, and I think it's a, uh, and a smaller country can actually do a lot. I mean, Luxembourg is a good example. The, uh, uh, the uh, they've put a lot of money into, into commercial space development. Uh, a couple of the companies they've invested in have now had initial public offerings of, you know, several billion euros. And uh, so it's turned out to be very successful for them. That's that's what I love in space talks that dig these stories and and then you find this kind of amazing story about a Bhutan going to space. So my my goal in space talks is also to inspire people by the space sector. So uh, Pete, what piece of advice you can give to that to those looking for the path? into the space sector? Well, I think the key thing is, uh, you know, and there's a lot of people ask, well, what does Silicon Valley have that other places don't? And uh, I think the, the key in Silicon Valley is that it's, it's all right to fail. And actually it's good to fail because if you learn what made you fail. And uh, I think we're seeing that spirit begin to, I mean, Luxembourg is, you know, initially they had a couple companies that failed and there was a lot of controversy, but then they said, okay, that's part of the, the effort. So, you know, my advice to somebody entering the space sector is uh, you're going to fail and uh, it's, it's good for you. It, uh, you know, there's, there's an old saying that what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. And uh, I think that, that my advice to people going into it is, is, you know, you don't want to fail, but you should be ready to fail. And if you do, Don't feel ashamed. Get up and you know learn your lesson and start over again. And uh, I mean, if you look at the successful people like Elon Musk, you know he he failed a lot before he finally got rockets to work. And the uh, same with uh, Branson's effort and uh, and uh, you know in some sense uh, uh, Bezos. So I, I guess my my point is uh, you know it's very exciting stuff. You know, don't be afraid to fail. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, so, Pete, thank you very much for our talk. Uh, we learned a lot. We learned a lot about your organization and amazing stories uh, coming from you. So, I hope to catch you somewhere in the space sector <laughs> soon. And once well, again, I hope thank to you visit, for your time. You know, once the once the COVID is over, I hope to visit uh, visit Poland and and uh, you know, as I so said, this will be our next be... meeting for sure. <laughs> thank you All once right. again. Sounds great. Thank you much. Thank <laughs> you.